Um, if we look at the bottom part of page one, Australia's free trade policies, we can see Australia began reducing its barriers to trade in 1975 when tariffs were cut by 25% across the board. Before this point, Australia was a highly protected economy. Um, and the key thing that caused this to happen in 1975, and it was actually considered a bit of a failure by a lot of economists, was the fact that Australia had um, a, a stagflation at that time. High inflation, high unemployment caused by the oil shock of the early to mid 70s. And Australia was also running a current account surplus at the time. And so the idea of cutting barriers to trade was not really a huge problem. The, the bigger problem were the internal factors, the internal problems of high unemployment, um, high inflation, low economic growth, and the idea of cutting barriers to trade was that it would reduce inflation. Um, and we'll see that that actually is one of the major impacts, and particularly cutting tariffs. Um, that was also, funnily enough, the last time Australia ran a current account surplus, so it was the last time that was used as a reason. Uh, moving on, reductions to barriers to trade picked up from 1988 onwards with the aim of forcing domestic firms to become, and here's the three things, three different descriptions you can use for it, more outward looking, so become more export orientated, to become more responsive to consumer demand, so to be more innovative, and to promote structural change. And there we're talking about allocative efficiency. Remember we have three types of efficiencies. Anyone remember what the three types of efficiency were? I've given you one there. Um, I uh, very good, so one is dynamic, which you gave me. Uh, two is allocative, which I've written there. And what is the third one? And three is technical, very good. Technical. Um, allocative efficiency, which is the one mentioned there, what it talks about is allocating resources within the economy. So are we allocating our resources to the car industry or to the mining industry or to services? Um, technical efficiency is how much productivity exists in each of those industries. So how, many, how much output can you get for each unit of input? Um, can we now produce three cars for every worker, whereas last year we could only produce two cars for every worker? Okay, it's different to allocative efficiency. That's how you allocate your resources between um, industries. Technical efficiency is how much output you get for each additional um, unit of resource. Dynamic efficiency is the hardest one to understand and also the hardest one to get, and that is um, being responsive to changes in the economy, being able to innovate, um, and removing barriers to trade exposing uh, trade industries or trade exposed industries to these sorts of um, market forces is designed also to improve dynamic efficiency to an extent to have them innovate, respond to changes a lot more. Uh, final point, uh, non-tariff barriers were also removed with quotas, subsidies and local content rules gradually phased out. Today there are very few or almost none of those remaining. However, Australia's strict quarantine rules have been criticised as heavily protecting the domestic agriculture sector. Do you guys remember a few years ago, um, uh, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, had those TV ads where he said, don't let these guys in, they're going to ruin our, our environment, you know, these little bugs, uh, you'll be fine, you can't bring them in through customs, um, or quarantine is the correct term, would have been. Quarantine prevents uh, living organisms from entering the country. Customs, what that is, is it's about uh, paying taxes, so that's your, your tariffs. Quarantine is about preventing um, pre predominantly microorganisms, any living things that aren't native to Australia in particular that could cause an imbalance to the Australian environment. Because Australia is an island continent, an island country, we have been protected from a lot of those things. And um, However, quarantine has been criticised for being de facto trade protection. And to some extent, or to a large extent, it has that impact. Um, but it's, it's something that a lot of economists would say, no, is different to trade protection is um, required to be in place in a way that trade protection that stifles these types of efficiencies um, do not. Uh, any questions about that first page? No, if we go on to the next one. Um, so a bit more on Australia's free trade policies. Today, Australia is one of the least protected economies in the world. Most goods are tariff-free. There is a 5% tariff on manufactured goods. Uh, and high tariffs on TFC. TFC, uh, you might hear about its textiles, footwear and clothing. Um, they have tariffs of about 10%. Um, the car industry also used to have tariffs that were above that 5% figure. Um, today it's, it's come down to about 5%. Um, with some of the countries we have free trade agreements with, they've actually fallen to below 5%, down to almost, or to zero. Um, and uh, soon they're going to be done away with because they're going to count as what's called a nuisance tariff. Nuisance tariffs are tariffs on goods and services that aren't produced in Australia. 
Okay, so any goods and services that I'm producing in Australia do not have a tariff on them, um, and those were some of the first tariffs to be removed because there was no purpose to having them. The average tariff was 36% in 1969. It's fallen to 19% in 1987, and then 1.8% 1 in 2011. And there's a table showing you how it's come down. Um, and you can see there was a big cut from the 60s to the 70s. That was the 25% across the board tariff cuts. So all tariffs were cut by a quarter. Um, and it was in the late 80s that it really started to fall quite a bit. Now, why is it that we encourage um, free trade? It's all about these improvements in efficiency. And if you think about it in terms of aggregate supply and aggregate demand, and if you have space um, in your handout, or if you have space in your book under the title, under the heading rather, um, Australia's, uh, or free trade and protection in Australia, I'd recommend drawing this diagram there. So we have the, the price level, or CPI, as your vertical scale, uh, vertical axis, and then real GDP here on your horizontal axis, zero. You've got your aggregate supply and your aggregate demand over here, okay, and that gives us our initial point of equilibrium, uh, which is C zero and. Y0, and it's going to be an AS0. What does free trade allow? It allows um, an opening up to more markets, it encourages innovation, um, it allows economies of scale, it makes firms more outward looking, it allows a cut in prices because consumers and firms are able to find a wider variety of goods um, at lower prices. And so what that does is, it pushes your aggregate supply curve to the right, from AS0 to AS1, okay, so it shifts your aggregate supply curve to the right. And you get to a new point of equilibrium at Y1, P1. We like this a lot as economists. As economists, you're gonna love this sort of graph because, or this movement, because your prices come down, but your income goes up. Ideally, that is the, the ultimate, the, the, the preferred option. In theory, in practice, it's a lot more complicated. But in theory, you have lower prices, so it increases your purchasing power, and you also have increased income. So you actually have a greater level of income with which to, to buy things. Um, and that's the idea of what free trade and reduction in trade barriers is meant to achieve. Of course, that's in the long term. In the short term, we're going to see there are a lot of drawbacks, a lot of disadvantages, um, and this isn't exactly how it works, particularly in the short term. But the long term goal is to achieve this, to unleash market forces, to allow uh, the new point of equilibrium to be reached, to have higher incomes, lower prices, greater levels of economic output.